And Elaine and I want to also welcome everybody. We've got uh, only about a third of the people who have registered are online. People will be trickling in as we go. We had more than 70 folks sign up for this webinar, which makes it our uh, largest webinar to date. Uh, and we're really delighted that uh, you all have joined us. We've got uh, some longtime uh, listeners in Portland, Ontario, Detroit, Seattle, Elkhart, and elsewhere. We've also got a lot of uh, folks coming on for the first time uh, or second time. Uh, in particular, we want to recognize that there's a, a number of folks from Chicago and from the Christian Peacemaker Team Network who are uh, on or coming on the webinar. So welcome to you. Uh, and uh, I think there's a couple of special welcomes you want to make, right? There are. I am so delighted that Dennis and Tenzi, and Dennis, it's really OK you didn't get that haircut. We're not going to see you tonight. So we're very yeah, delighted yeah. that you have joined us. Open yeah, door, thank you all for being there. And a special thank you to Isaac, Lydia, and Aaron. I'm delighted you're joining us tonight. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to chat in to Liz to unmute? She is. She, I just heard her say, okay. amen. Great. We're good. All right. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, uh, thank you again to all of you folks that are joining us tonight, and thank you very much to Liz, uh, who's willing to uh, struggle with us with this technology so that we can do um, this webinar together. So I want to begin uh, with just a minute or two of scriptural reflection to set the tone for tonight. So let us revisit an extraordinary biblical metaphor. John the Revelator's vision of a woman struggling to protect life in the face of a beast who threatens incalculable violence. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son. The dragon is one of many master symbols used by this apocalyptic writer, who was a p political prisoner of the Roman Empire in the late first century of the Common Era. In Revelation, the dragon is the master metaphor for the lethal violence of empire. It's intent to devour the child, as indeed empires do. This is, however, a clear intra-biblical allusion to the gospel tale of Herod's slaughter of the innocents, a story which in turn is patterned on the old Exodus story of Pharaoh's war on the Hebrew firstborn, in which it was midwives who rescued the kids from the king. Like the Levite mother of Moses, the woman in Revelation 12 gives birth to a child in the teeth of the dragon, nurturing life in defiance of the power of death. And like the story of Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, this woman confronts a war machine armed only with the power of love. So this mysterious woman in Revelation 12 thus embodies the dictum of the great contemplative Thomas Merton, who wrote during the darkest days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Christian hope begins where every other hope stands frozen stiff before the face of the unspeakable. John the Revelator further tells us that this cosmic woman is clothed with the sun, stands on the moon, and is crowned with stars. This evocative celestial image is admittedly strange. If it weren't identified as a New Testament text, it would no, about, no doubt be dismissed by most religious folk as some sort of New Age rant or drug-infused hallucination. 
But of course, John's main allusion here is to Mary of Nazareth, the courageous peasant girl who birthed Jesus while fleeing as a political refugee from Herod's pogroms. This is why Catholic iconography often celebrates Mary as the woman clothed with the sun, particularly in the beautiful image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the patroness of indigenous peasants who were displaced by Spanish colonization in Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. This is just a heads up, but this coming December, our Advent webinar will be looking at the remarkable story and tradition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So John's vision continues with the pointed refrain, reiterated three times in Revelation 12, that this woman takes refuge from the beast in the wilderness. The revelator is clearly drawing on the old Exodus motif of Israel's escape from Pharaoh into the desert. But whereas in that old story, creation joins the rebellion rising up against the empire in the famous series of plagues, here the wilderness receives and protects this refugee from imperial violence. This nurturing hospitality gives new meaning to the term Mother Nature. This aspect of John's vision offers a symbol of the church as the community of nonviolent resistance in alliance with the earth herself. A true peace church must express the double capacity represented by the woman of Revelation 12, the courage to stand in the way of the dragon and the fortitude to dwell in the wilderness when marginalized or persecuted by that dragon. There is so much to these images that would be worth reflecting further on, but we are anxious to get on to our main topic tonight. So, suffice it to say that in our opinion, John's vision is embodied magnificently by Liz McAllister, who you will get to hear from tonight. Liz is truly a woman clothed with the sun, who has endeavored to stand time and again before the dragon of war and weapons of mass destruction for more than 50 years now, on behalf of the children of today and of the future. So I just want to offer a little bit of background and context. Liz McAllister is a former Roman Catholic nun who gained notoriety in the late 1960s because of her nonviolent resistance to the Vietnam War. She then married activist priest Philip Berrigan, and together they founded Jonah House in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland, which for 40 years now has been on the forefront of prophetic Christian witness against militarism and the nuclear arms race. So before we interview Liz, I want to draw your attention um, to a profile that I did of her in Chapter 6 of our Ambassadors of Reconciliation book, Volume 2. And I hope that after you've met uh, Liz tonight through our webinar, you'll go back to that chapter and read more about her rem remarkable life and witness. So I just want to highlight a couple of aspects of Liz's journey, and then Chad and I will talk with her and she can fill you in more. So the first story I want to share is about the plowshares action that Liz participated in in the 1980s. On Thanksgiving Day, November 24, 1983, Liz and six other peacemakers entered Griffith Air Force Base in Rome, New York. And in a symbolic attempt to turn swords into plowshares, they hammered on B-52 bombers carrying cruise missiles and poured their own blood on them. They left at the site of their witness a written indictment of the United States government pointing to the war crimes of pre preparing for nuclear war. While such a dramatic and risky action may seem disturbing to many who are from unfamiliar with this tradition of protest, these activists were trying to enact Isaiah's prophecy that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war no more. Excuse me, learn war anymore. So in the interview that I did with Liz for our ambassador's book, 
she told me, I could not have done this action unless I felt under mandate of scripture to beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. It was a momentous thing to do, and yet I had to do something against this death system. In federal court, the seven activists were tried for conspiracy and destruction of government prop property. An excerpt from Liz's trial diary, later published as Farewell to Nuclear Arms, states, The intent of the government, speaking of intent, is very clear. They seek to establish what we've loudly claimed, that we hammered on, painted, and poured our blood on weapons, and to seek a conviction on sabotage and destruction of government property together, and slide in conspiracy. Now they seek to shut down our defense, to shut down a discussion and presentation of justification, to shut down any discussion of the weapons themselves. The Griffiths Plowshares activists were convicted and received prison sentences ranging from two to three years, which Liz served at the Alderson's women, Alderson Women's Penitentiary. At the time of this action, Liz had three small children at home, and the youngest was two and a half when Liz began serving her two-year prison sentence. Liz is deeply concerned for her children and all children around the world, since the young are most adversely affected by war, and this informed her difficult decision to be away from her kids for that time. But as a result of Liz's commitment, Liz's commitment to nonviolent resistance, she has infused all three of her and Phil's children. As adults, adults, each child is involved in unique expressions of peace and justice work. Frida is the oldest and lives in Connecticut. Jerry is the middle child and lives in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And Kate is the youngest, living in Philadelphia. And I am sure that Liz will have more to say about these wonderful people later on. Another aspect of Liz's work I want to highlight is her experiments with urban homesteading. Almost 20 years ago, she and the Jonah House community began the long and ongoing process of transforming a 22-acre inner city cemetery into vegetable gardens, orchards, and retreat space. And we'll ask Liz more about that amazing ongoing project as we go. I also want to mention that Liz has mentored hundred, hundreds of activists, and that includes Ched and I. Liz is a gifted teacher of both scripture and the history of social change. I've had the privilege of organizing a couple of women's discipleship retreats with Liz, where we looked at stories of women in the Bible and Liz helped us recognize ourselves in the stories of women like Rachel and Leah, Shipra and Pua, Mary and Martha, and other women of courage and faith. Liz worked with us to rescue these texts from patriarchal interpreters so that we could realize afresh our vocations. Liz is also constantly accompanying younger activists, not only in the streets, but through life as a friend and counselor. Liz is in so many ways a mother of the movement. And I'm very grateful for grandmothers like Liz, who are strong enough to stand up to the beast, yet gentle enough to listen other women into speech. The consistent gospel message coming from Liz and Jonah House has been that if Christians do not experiment with nonviolence as a way of life, then the world will be sentenced to unending wars of empire. In my interview, she told me, Plowshares' actions might not be the way, but they are a way of stating very clearly these nuclear weapons have no right to exist. We do these nonviolent actions knowing the risk to our own freedom to try to disarm a system of domination. These weapons allow us to invade other countries, 
to have access to their oil, tin, fruit, and coffee. People of conscience cannot accept this violence that impoverishes the majority and provides wealth for only a few. We need to practice nonviolent resistance, and we also need to disarm our hearts. Liz and her two longtime companions at Jonah House, Dominican sisters Ardeth Platt and Carol Gilbert, are the heart and soul of the Plowshares movement. These women elders have been exemplary in their vocations, and we are all indebted to them. So that's a little bit of context, especially for those of you who are new to uh, Liz, Liz's story and the legacy of Jonah House. Now we get to talk with Liz. And Liz, thank you so much for uh, joining all of us virtually here online. And we're, it's just a real privilege to, uh, to talk with you. So welcome. Thanks for all the work you put into this, Elaine and Chad. You're awesome. Love you. <laughs> all right. All right, um, and welcome to, to I see so many around. names of friends on this, participants. I wish I could talk personally with each of you. Well, you're, you're getting to be heard by a lot of folk tonight. We want to begin at the beginning and invite you to reflect a little bit on your own upbringing, whatever you want to say about your, your family, and, uh, and especially your early years in... Uh, in religious formation, which I know were important to you. So what do you want to tell us about that? Well, you asked about early influences, and you mentioned people like Merton and Dorothy and Stringfellow. I have to include two Carmelite priests who were part of the faculty and staff at the college where I went, Marymount College, and the community I entered, the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, one was Joachim Snyder and the other Anselm Burke. And I think the big thing with Father Snyder was his emphasis with women at the college on a life of prayer. And he encouraged that and directed that. And you know, that was the beginning of something very new for me. And Anselm Burke was just a kind of poet. and made the scriptures come alive. You also mentioned Merton, and I never met Thomas Merton. I certainly read Thomas Merton. But I do credit Merton um, and, and feel him close in my life. The morning he died, um, a friend who was both a Jesuit and an attorney we drove him to the airport to fly down to Baltimore. And he had a petition for the release of Philip and Tom Lewis from prison. This is mid-December. They had been in prison since the uh, Catonsville Nine action. They held them because the Catonsville Nine action occurred in between conviction and sentencing for the Baltimore Four action, which was the first of the draft board actions. And Bill and I believe Merton were influential in having both Philip and Tom released on personal recognizance while their cases were on um, appeal. Um, and, and I think that release is really attributable to Thomas Merton, whom Phil did know and, and knew well. Have I lost this? Um, yeah, back again. You then asked about Dorothy. And for sure, Dorothy was an influence. I met her at the Catonsville trial, I think, for the first time. And she was there. We were there. Um, what I remember most about her was her leadership, and actually the Catholic worker leadership, in the resistance to the Vietnam War. 
it was people from the Catholic worker who were consistently at the induction centers and blocking induction of men into the military, which was a powerful witness against the war. And people from the Catholic worker frequently engaged in the actions of burning their draft cards when that was a federal crime and facing prison for that. But there was also a conflict in much of this because there were people who went and participated in actions from the Catholic worker and were arrested and were held. And she would say to them, I'm returned, you were on schedule to feed the poor. Um, and I think that was, she was criticized for that. But upon reflection, I think what we're dealing with here is an issue of communication. You know, when you are taking a risk, as many of them took, then you have to find ways of replacing yourself back at the ranch, so to speak. And maybe it was as much an issue of not, of, of poor communication. And I think that underscores something that has to go on in community, especially in resistance community, especially in community where Things aren't as regimented, and you have to deal with things as they come up. Um, so I don't know the inner dynamics, but I think I can make some guesses that there were times when she probably did get absolutely frustrated because she's already overworked and now filling in for people who are doing the colorful actions, as often happens, eh? Those of us in community know those realities very well. And at the same time, she herself was not opposed to acting. But I think largely people knew when she was uh, planning in that fashion. Um, so to let community know when a risk uh, that could result in arrest and jail is contemplated. Um, Bill Stringfellow was another whom you mentioned. What a gift. And Bill was the one who introduced me to the writings of Elul, Jacques Elul. What a gift that was. Violence. His book, simply called Violence, is one of the finest things on violence I've ever read. Like many books from our library that are really good, it has disappeared. I've not been able to find a replacement. <laughs> Apocalypse was another. Um, but Bill also gave us a vision of seminary that had to do with the study of scripture rather than so many things that are not as relevant to seminary as that. And I know that uh, Bill Wiley Kellerman has picked up very, very deeply on that, as have both of you. And I, I think that's part of the inspiration, isn't it, behind Word and World and that, that effort. Um, but uh, Liz, let me let me jump. Yeah, let me go jump ahead. Um, I think our listeners are very curious how you how you first encountered um, some of these folks, and particularly how you encountered um, these activist priests, the Berrigan brothers. Um, and if you could just tell us how how you encountered them and how you encountered them and also tell us uh, about the influence of that Chaytonsville 9 action which you've already uh, referred to, uh, the influence that those things had on your journey and how you got involved through that. Well, I was in Tarrytown, New York, teaching at Marymount College there. We had a sister college in New York City, Marymount Manhattan College. A very close friend of mine, Sister Joe Exegum, was the president at that college. Dan Berrigan was assigned to Jesuit missions, um, which had its offices in New York City. And he frequently came to Marymount to celebrate liturgy on weekday mornings with the nuns. 
and he would do the mass, but he would also each day turn around and give a homily that could be five minutes long but blew people's minds. So the friendship developed out of that, and he came to Terrytown as well, and I began reading his books. And Phil, um, we met somewhat later, I actually met Phil at the funeral of the Catholic worker who was killed on the streets. Just he had two dollars in his pocket, and they, it was a mugging that ended in his death. Phil came up from Baltimore to celebrate that funeral. Then he was buried up, I guess, in Tivoli, and came back to Tarrytown that afternoon for lunch with the people with whom he was traveling. And the relationship just grew, you know. Um, you need to know that Catonsville was not the first of the draft board actions. The first of those actions was the Baltimore Four. Phil, Tom Lewis, um, uh, David Everhart, and a clergyman from Baltimore whose name is escaping me at the moment, went to the customs house with blood and poured the blood on the draft board files. And I heard about this action in this most dismissive tone on the radio, car radio, as I was traveling on an errand someplace. And I said, I want to know more about this. And then found out that evening who it was. And of course, we said gratitude and went down for that trial, too. And it was a very powerful witness that they had made. And then people began planning for Keatonsville. And that was a much larger witness and one that really got the attention of the public. And it was the second major action. Um, though I believe, no, I don't believe, I know, who was inspired with the Baltimore Four action by the action of a Quaker family in the Midwest. And for a number, for about a week, the father and his family, they had something like three sons, collected the family fecal material. And when he felt he had enough, went down to the local draft board and poured it on the draft files. So um, he said, no son of mine is going to fight in your wars. So we like to refer to that as the movements that began a movement. Um, and so, as I say, was very taken by that. But um, yeah. Um, where, where am I with this? Catonsville. Yeah. Um, so Catonsville, from Catonsville, we were at the trial and they were already talking about the next action and recruiting people for what became the, the Milwaukee 14. Now, the Milwaukee 14 went into the draft board in Milwaukee where there were literally nine distinct draft boards which covered the whole city and environs of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And those guys took it out in one night. You know, they just grabbed all of these files and took them outside and burned them in a, in a public square. Um, and, you know, Phil got six years for Catonsville and they got a year for Nine draft boards. There's no uh, justice in this. How are we doing with that, Chet? Mm -hmm. Great. Just um, one one other question, Liz, about this era, which um, is known to many folks over 40, but less known, perhaps, to some of our younger listeners. A lot happened between. Uh, oh yeah. 14 action through 69, 70, uh, 70, 71, and 2, um, which included uh, Dan going underground uh, in the spring of 1970 or being arrested on Block mm -hmm. Island later that summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, of course, the Harrisburg trial, which, uh, Harrisburg yep. 7 trial, which of course you were part of, and, and maybe you could fill in some of that history for some of our listeners. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I want to refer to a film that recently came out, and it's called Hidden Stay, 
And it's a documentary film that's largely made by a local Baltimorean by the name of Joe Turpea. And Joe traces that whole series of actions and the people involved in it. He worked for years on this film. Um, by and large, it's very, very good. And um, it, it, I, I, the numbers of people that he interviewed and worked with, the numbers of actions that are described in that film are pretty astonishing. I had figured there was about 100 draft board actions in total. He, in his research, established 300. 300 draft board actions. At a time when these records were what they had, there was no computer backup. And when people destroyed those records, they were gone. There was no backup. I was part of the draft board action that did um, the state boards in Wilmington, Delaware. And we literally took the files out with us. And then we mailed them to the men with a letter that said, here's your file. They don't have it anymore. We would prefer you not go and register again. But um, of course, we don't know what happened, except that we do know that by the time we were halfway through this period, um, they were talking about ending the draft. And, of course, that was ultimately substituted for by the all-volunteer army that we've known since Vietnam. Um, and then, of course, the government began trying to subterfuge our so-called subterfuge and using informants and using provocateurs. And certainly the Camden 28, which was really the last of the draft board actions, experienced that in spades, where literally the FBI, through their informant, paid for their meals, paid for their equipment, paid for their, you know, directed their scoping and the whole nine yards. And the action would not have happened without the, um, the person hired by the FBI to, quote, be part of it, unquote. In the first part of that trial, he testified for the prosecution and talked about their plans and his part in them. And then his young son fell out of a tree and was impaled on the fence and killed. His funeral was celebrated by McDoyle, one of the defendants, and a priest in Camden. His funeral was attended by all of the Camden 28. And they were the ones who were the support for the family. And when it came to the defense, he reappeared as a witness for the defense and spoke about the, the truth of his participation. And it was absolutely stunning. It's also the only action uh, where there was a, an acquittal, a complete acquittal. And after it, a party of <laughs> the jury and the defendants and their families and their friends. One of the most amazing trials in history. And all of this does come out very, very beautifully in this film. So I, I'd like to recommend it. And um, but it, it also introduced that whole period of, you know, being watched and being followed and being, you know, provoked. And that's the, the Harrisburg, so-called Harrisburg Conspiracy Trial, was Boy Douglas working for the FBI and trying to make things happen that people didn't really want to have happen. What's interesting is that in both the Harrisburg Conspiracy Trial and in the Camden 28 trial, the government put tremendous effort into making these prosecutions happen, we know that they spent over a million dollars in Harrisburg. And it was, they could not get a conviction. So they didn't try it again. And of course, they got an acquittal 
in, in Camden. So it's, um, it's an interesting kind of thing to see how our efforts to struggle against the draft, to struggle against the war by struggling against the draft, were quite, in a sense, successful. But then it leads to something, something else you need to deal with. And yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Um, Liz, two things uh, before we move to the next chapter of, of this journey. One, uh, several of our listeners wanted you to repeat the name of, of that film that you mentioned. What's the title of that film? Hit and Stay. Hit and Stay. Which was what happened with the Baltimore 4, the Catonsville 9, the Milwaukee 14, and a number of DC-9, and a number of these earlier actions. But then people began not hitting and staying, but surfacing, um, because they couldn't hit and stay. It became necessary to go into draft boards at night. It became necessary to use that kind of subterfuge to get in, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And he traces all of that, and he does a very, very good job tracing that that mm -hmm. history and that process. And with the government making it more and more difficult, following people and putting spies in, um, you know, people change tactics basically. But in changing tactics, um, you also go ahead. Go ahead. Um, there, there's a story that you told us, you know, you don't know what effect some of these actions, particularly the, the, the draft file actions, have. Uh, you do it because it's right. You, you, you have a beautiful story of meeting someone years later, uh, the, the guy in the airport. Could you tell that story? That's such a beautiful yeah. story. Yeah. My nephew's son, this is Philip Berrigan. The, eldest of Jerry and Carol Berrigan's four children. And Philip is married to Cindy, and they have a daughter and a son who's also Philip. And no, at any rate, he came and spent a week or so with us as a young kid. And I was taking him to the airport to fly back to Syracuse. And he was so young that you have to escort him to the gate, which you know, you've got to get a certain pass from the uh, airlines to be able to accompany somebody young who's flying out unaccompanied. So the man was looking at our identifications, and he smiled, and he gave me the pass, and he said, Berrigan McAllister, yeah. My draft card was in Catonsville, and I never went. And I've been eternally grateful every day. Go ahead. That was, that's the one you meant, Chad. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Run across people from time to time who will acknowledge that. It's really stunning. Mm -hmm. Liz, can okay. we ask, we'd like, we'd like you to share uh, whatever you'd like to share about your marriage to Phil and the process uh, of which you you decided to begin both this community and and a family um, in 1973 and 74. So how did how did Jonah House come to be? How did you how did you choose uh, that name? Mm -hmm. Well, Jonah House came to be because we had a recognition that. There was a need for a community of resistance where people could act, take the consequences, and have a place they could come home to, which would be home, where during whatever the consequences of that action, they would be supported, and they would have a home to come home to. Um, you know, it's very, very hard to take those kinds of risks when you are trying to earn a living and pay rent or pay mortgage or whatever. 
and it seemed to us that there was a need for that kind of community. And while there were Catholic worker communities that have done that and continue to do that kind of support, they tended to be, mm, what, how do you put this, less, um, less of a sense of permanence to them, more transient. People come and go, it seems, much more quickly. And that was the concept behind um, trying to establish a community that would help to develop a sense of community in itself and about it. So we spent some time, really a year, of meeting and planning and working to make that happen. And <clears throat> moved into a rental house in inner city Baltimore in June of 1973, after Phil and I were married. Um, and we remained in that house for 23 years. That's the one, Chad, that you knew so well. Anyhow, um, we did not make a decision to have a family. We had a family. <laughs> yeah. That's how All right. <laughs> Liz, um, in, in 1976, um, I came to, to Jonah House following LaDawn Sheets, who I'd met earlier that year, and that's where I first lived in 1933 Park Avenue. Um, your office uh, at that time was doing actions at the Pentagon and the White House. Talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. rhythm of resistance and family and community life um, during that period, and maybe, maybe you might even have a LaDawn story. Uh, and Everybody's dying to know the story behind this picture um, that your daughter unearthed um, a few months ago. So, got, got a few stories. Okay. Um, well, we began the uh, community keeping a focus on the war in Vietnam. That was 73. And our troops were thrown out of Vietnam in April of 1975. Um, we began to feel that we needed to make a change about 1974, and it was Alexander Haig, I believe, who was Secretary of War at the time, and he began talking about a change of our nuclear policy from MAD, mutually assured destruction, which is what it had been since really the end of World War II, to what he named FTO, Flexible and Strategic Targeting Options. And as we read about that policy change, it was rather, um, rather daunting because it meant two things, uh, basically. It meant a changing of our targeting of away from Soviet cities, which was part of the mutually assured destruction, and on to Soviet weapons sites. And the idea being to destroy their weapons before they could be used. And as we began reading and reflecting on what this meant, it became clear to us that the nation was talking about a, developing a first strike nuclear capability, and B, um, you know, really going ahead and, if not using it, at least threatening to use it. Uh, but we decided to stay with the war in Vietnam until that was finished and do the studying and the updating that we could do. So. Our first actions, once we were thrown out of Vietnam in April of 1975, um, brought us to the White House. And we had learned about this proposal to use salt mines in wherever we had them as um, bomb shelters. And that seemed like digging graves. So. 
we began digging graves and we dug some graves on the White House lawn and you know in the days when it was possible to get into the White House and do tours through it you could also open and display banners and that picture was taken on the driveway in front of the White House facing Pennsylvania Avenue and people had poured blood on the front pillars of the White House and we were walking with banners up and down the driveway and the cop grabbed my arm, one of my arms as you can see behind my back and I wanted the banner to show a little bit longer so I grabbed it with my teeth and my other hand. So that's right in front of the White House, that, that picture. Um, yeah, LaDon. LaDon had been at uh, Koinonia in Americus, Georgia. He had been an IBM executive, a rising star in that. And he used to say, you can take LaDon out of IBM, but you can't take IBM out of LaDon. Mm -hmm. um, but he would do some traveling and speaking, and whenever his traveling brought him anywhere in the vicinity of Baltimore, or that were on the way to where he was going, he would call and come by, and we would always have a very, very powerful evening with him. As you know, he was one for good, solid conversation. And he began sharing with us this. Um, they had, of course, made him director at Koinonia. And as director, he wanted Koinonia to stop taking, you know, tax out of people's paychecks. And said we should not be tax collectors for this war effort. And that did not get backing from the Board of Trustees. So he felt in conscience he needed to quit and then called and said one day in 1975, I'm quitting, can I come? We said, come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he and Jay joined us at that time, Jay Dudgeon. Um, and introduced a, a beautiful um, dynamic into the community of which was very, very reflective. And you know, he continued to do the traveling and speaking that he was doing. A lot of us did that kind of work. And would often bring friends into the house and conversations were powerful and life giving. Um, he was also good with the little people, the children. They, they took to him very, very uh, strongly. And he to them. Um, we had one visitor, and Ladan said, you know, you have had a number of children. Maybe you can give us some advice about how to deal with their behavior sometimes at table where you know, Frida and Jerry learned a marvelous dynamic of making it impossible for me to be part of supper conversation. You know, <laughs> they, uh, they learned all kinds of, of dynamics. So he put this question to our guest and the guest said, this is very memorable, well when it comes to raising children I think of what the scripture always says about raising children. And, you know, we all paused because you can think of maybe one or two things about children in the Gospels. He said, yes, it came to pass. It came to pass not to stay. <laughs> and when it comes to dealing with children, you have to remember that it came to pass not to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz, quite memorable. Is a, um, <laughs> important turning point in uh, the Jonah House story was the the first plowshares action, and uh, maybe yeah. you want to say a few things about that. Well. We had focused in our resistance on the uh, Pentagon. We discovered that that would be a good place to act, and we did many Pentagon actions. But um, we had friends who had a sense that 
There's this GE plant in King of Prussia, and they are building the Mark 12A warheads. And this is a first strike nuclear weapon. And he said people could get in. People could get in and approach those weapons. Now, you're not talking about a nuclear weapon with the nukes in it. These are in production weapons in production. So they are not lethal weapons yet, but they are to be lethal weapons. So they, of course, related very, very deeply to it, and others did too, and he did some recruiting and talking, and John Shushar did a fair share of recruiting, and we ended up with a group of nine people. Uh, including Dan and Phil. So the group in this picture, Carl Cabot, Amar Moss, Philip, Daniel, John Shushart, um, and in front, Molly, Anne, and one. It will come to me. Anyhow, Dean, Dean Hammer. So they became the first file shares group. And in the Prussia, left them in the Norristown jail. And they were initially charged with maybe 20 charges. Um, they were initially on like a million dollars bail. It came down some. Dan came out. The Jesuits put up bail for him. And they encouraged, I guess it was Anne and Dean to come out, Molly also. But Phil, Elma, and John remained in. John was an attorney, and John began a dynamic that went on in Norristown, which went on with them, where they would charge people with umpteen crimes and then get them to plea bargain to a couple. And he began working with the men and helping them. And more and more of them were taking their cases to trial. <laughs> so they had to get rid of them. And literally, in the middle of January, the action was the 9th of September, we get a phone call that <clears throat> Carl, Phil, John, and Elmer are on the street with their boxes. and. Nobody knew. And they didn't even sign an agreement to appear for trial, though they did definitely appear for trial. Um, so the trial was really an intense experience. And it began to open many people's minds to the fact that there can be more of this. They called themselves the Plowshares Eight. In Connecticut was a focus of a number of actions, and then a similar facility in Rhode Island. Um, and then we came with a focus on Griffiths Air Force Base, where they were re-retrofitting B-52 bombers that had done so much of the damage in Vietnam to now be carrier launchers for air launch cruise missiles. And we went into a hangar at Griffiths Air Force Base and hammered and poured blood on the B-52, and then on five engines for B-52s and for some of the escort planes. And we were charged with um, sabotage in that trial. We were looking at a very, very long time. It was also the first plowshares action that was federal, because uh, the previous actions had been at corporations that were producing equipment for the uh, federal the Department of War. 
And um, that trial was held in Syracuse. It went on for five weeks. We were able to put on a number of extraordinary witnesses. And the result was that we were acquitted of sabotage. We were convicted of destruction of government property. We were convicted of trespass. We were convicted of conspiracy to destroy government property, but not of sabotage. So the three men involved and I were given three years, and the other three women two years in prison. And, you know, we, it was close to what we had anticipated getting. So that's, uh, and then these actions continued. Um, the next action was against the Euro missiles. And this was the time when the resistance to this first strike nuclear capability went pretty much global, at least into Europe. And the Europeans began acting, Germany, Scotland, England, New Zealand, Australia. Um, so those, those actions continued um, and, and are continuing, I think, more in Europe. And of course, New Zealand and Australia have had some wonderful actions of late. So yeah, <laughs> indeed, the, the, the plowshares uh, witness really spawned a whole um, tradition of nonviolent direct action in the same way that Catonsville had done um, yeah. mm -hmm. 15 years earlier. Um, yeah. Now, Liz... Um, had two very recent actions that should be uh, just at least acknowledged, and one was the disarm now plowshares out at the um, Trident submarine base in, um, in the state of Washington. And people served, you know, a year, six months to a year for that action. But just recently, just uh, last month, three friends, Megan Rice, Greg Borchi, Obed, and Michael Wally, the Transform Now plowshares, were convicted in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they are convicted of sabotage in their action against um, the uh, <clears throat> the Oak Ridge facility down there. And they are looking at very, very serious time and are being looked at as terrorists. It's, it's a big one. It's a big one. Now, you and, and many of these activists have done a lot of traveling and speaking. And Liz is a, a magnificent speaker and teacher, but also a writer. and. Those of you who are looking to see some of her words, this is a book that she and Phil wrote in 1989. And fortunately for us, it's been republished thanks to the Catholic Worker Reprint series and is available from Whippenstock. Mm -hmm. um, Liz, I think we want to, because we're mindful of the time, we want to be sure and get to another major chapter in the history of Jonah House. Yeah, Liz, we wanted to ask how you how St. Peter's, the move to St. Peter's, the uh, decision to leave the inner city and, and move out to uh, the cemetery, how did that, that come about and, and uh, how did you imagine that together as a community? Yeah, well, you know, we're still in the inner city. I, this yes, cemetery are. exists right in the inner city that the south fence line has projects on the other side of that fence and the east fence is a whole row of row houses, and the north fence is a is a tire recycling plant that uh, puts us in touch. And the helicopters fly overhead. The police are there all the time, and so on and so forth. Um, Chad, well, both of you will know, and anybody who ever visited us on Park Avenue there, what a you know interesting name for an address that was far from Park Avenue-ish, as we think of Park Avenue. It was a row house. It was the center row house. It was 14 feet wide, you know. And you had windows in the front and windows in the back and a house on either side of it. The living room was such that you could not have a circle of more than eight people 
you know, it had to be broken up and twisted around. And being a row house, you could never get rid of the cockroaches. They would go next door and then come back and go next door and come back. So we've bought that for 23 years. And, you know, I think a lot of people were talking about at at that time about, you know, the idea of having space for gardens, space for, you know, kids, space for uh, trees and, you know, a vitality. Our backyard was a postage stamp. It was 14 feet wide and maybe 16 feet deep. And it had our wood pile and our clothesline and that was it. There was no room for anything else. So it was a dream and a vision and the little house that you see here, the little stucco house, had just been refurbished by the restoration, the cemetery restoration. It was an old Irish cemetery going back to 1851. And um, it had, um, the Irish all left Baltimore when the neighborhood changed and didn't come back. And there was no perpetual care fund for this cemetery. And the place just went completely to seed. And people who came and saw the state of it and the abuse that it was getting in the neighborhood were horrified. So this one group of Irish got together and established the Restoration um, Foundation. And they were responsible for redoing the little caretaker's cottage and putting a kitchen and bathroom on it. It just had an outhouse before. And they were looking for somebody who would go in there and live there and be a deterrent to crime in the cemetery. So we said, yeah, well, that looks very nice, but the house is too small. We'd have to build. And no problem, said our friend Vinnie Quayle, who was head of the foundation. and. It wasn't no problem. It was lots of problems, but we did it. You know, in the course of a year, over a hundred people volunteered their time and their energy and many people funds to build that house. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful center through these years. And we've got garden space and we've had animals and who help to maintain the place and clear it and enliven it and it's been a very welcoming uh, place that we planted probably about 300 400 trees since we've been here and they are growing and they are beautiful we want to uh, talk a bit more about that in a minute but first um one of the sacred places in yeah. the cemetery where phil is buried at, in 2002 Less than four months after we put Ladon in the ground in California, after four months of hospice, that was our community webinar story last summer, uh, and mm -hmm. Dennis attends here with us on this webinar tonight. Um, that webinar, by the way, is available for download from our webinar archive. But uh, shortly after that, your beloved Philip passed into the cloud of witnesses after a similar hospice journey. Anything you want to say about? how that journey affected the community's growth? Well, Phil was diagnosed um, with cancer in October, like October 6th. He died December 6th, so that was two months. He had one chemo treatment and said no more. And we came back from the hospital and went into hospice. And I think two weeks of hospice was about all we had. And the thing, it, it, was an, it was an amazing circle of people, and it was an amazing period of time. Phil was, OK, I'm dying. I'm ready to go. And as soon as he said to Jerry, I want you to make my coffin, and I want you to write this statement, um, then, and we had the last rites. He, he was ready and impatient, as it was part of his personality, not surprising. Um, and I 
once had to say to him, you know, it's a lot harder than you think. You're, you're going to be alive for the, <laughs> for the last rites. It's only a few hours away. This dying business takes a bit longer than that, man. So um, when you have that kind of spirit working around you, it's not something you say, no, 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 you can't go. You know, this man was ready to go. And, you know, right after his death, we begin a war in Iraq, another war in Iraq, and we're already in Afghanistan. And I found myself grateful that he didn't have to witness that. Um, it's quite a time. The stone is right there in the cemetery. One of the things he wanted was to be buried in this cemetery. And our friend Vinny got to the Cardinal this Saturday after Thanksgiving, and Cardinal Keeler said, well, that's the least we can do for Philip Arrogant. So our neighbors literally dug the grave for us. And yeah, it was a very, very powerful time. Very memorable time. Thanks for bringing it up. And one of the last places Phil and I went together was to California and to the LA Catholic Worker Sister Community Retreat. And we sat, I sat with you and Dennis and Tenzi, getting your experience of the whole hospice with Ladon. Um, we had an easier scene in terms of time. It was much, much more limited. And also in terms of burial. We live in a cemetery. It was not hard to get him from the house to the cemetery. And we could dig our own hole and fill it in and all of that. But very, very powerful. His presence is constant. The image that you see was well, <clears throat> was from our friend Bill McNichols, who does these beautiful icons. He did the icon of Phil underneath it. But his vision was of the flowering cross. And it was his sense that embraced the cross flowers. If you resist it, it doesn't. And it was his sense that Phil had embraced that. Very, very beautiful, powerful time. Thank you. Well, Liz, let's talk about some of the other aspects of the grounds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny that I uh, said that you moved outside of the inner city, because I've been to the new Jonah House at St. Peter's many times, and it is such an incredible oasis in the middle of inner city. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so many of us, and the younger generation is so uh, interested in uh, food growing and preservation and animal, animal husbandry and I have always been so delighted to see the incredible work that you've done there. So can you talk a little bit about your work with the animals and, and the, how much food you're producing? <clears throat> well, I have to share that at this moment our animals are down to the wild cats and the one domesticated cat and four guinea fowl. Um, I had surgery, hip surgery, in January and had not been able to do much work with them. And the two donkeys that we had, the standard donkey, had gotten pretty pissy about that and was getting hard to handle. And I knew I couldn't, couldn't uh, work with her for some time to come. So we found a new home for them. And then we had... This this picture shows the first of our Nubian goats, Paul and Silas. Silas is the lighter goat in the back there, and he was always an escape artist. So they you, you can't be spending every hour of every day chasing and catching them. And our most recent goats uh, got into the same thing, except all three of them were getting out constantly. So we found a new home for them, and the one remaining llama, we had to put the older llama down a couple of years ago. She had an infection that kept coming back. 
at this point, we're leaving whatever comes next in terms of animals to the people who will be taking over here. <clears throat> and I think that uh, the timing on that is really good. You're looking here at the compost tumblers. It's the only way we can do compost in the inner city that isn't food for rats. And you also see the hoop house, and not, I think that's garlic in front of it. Um, so <clears throat> the garden is doing well, though we have um, acquired deer on the property in the last year. And so we have to take all kinds of steps to keep the deer from eating all the food that we're trying to put away. But we're, we're succeeding. Mostly this is Ardeth's work. And asparagus and snoopies and beans are what we're getting at this point, as well as peaches and uh, strawberries and blueberries. So, and lettuce, lots of lettuce. Oh, that sounds wonderful, and I will not forget seeing the shelves of canned goods in your freezer full of wonderful food. Yes, you know, another, it's great. Another, it is. And another thing that really struck me about Jonah House um, is its, its simple elegance. It is such a beautiful place, and you talked about the hundreds of uh, the hundred people that came and helped you build that. And, but it's also filled um, with beauty inside. And I wonder, will you talk a moment um, about being an artist? Um, and in recent years, having the time to, to paint and sharing your beautiful paintings. We have a couple of them. How did you, you know, move into that and make the time for that? Well, it's really the consequence of Willa Bickham, who's uh, married to Brendan Walsh, and they have been the Catholic workers in Baltimore and friends for 45, 50 years. And that relationship is uh, and has been significant all these years. But um, Willa paints, she is an artist, and she has painted with a couple of other women for many, many years. So she encouraged it, and I said, OK, I'll give it a try, and have enjoyed that process very, very much. Um, and we have uh, had a show each year that we painted together. And we called it the Monday Night Masters art show. And it was at Viva House. And so it was not nothing pretentious about it. Our friends all came. And I think they were surprised that it was as good as it was. They didn't expect that. But at any rate, um, it's a good social opportunity. And you know, mostly that's it. But it's, it's a joy to have that as part of my life. I don't do it as much as I would like to. And yeah, um, it's added a lot. It's added a lot. Um, so we're, um, we're continuing. I'm continuing with it. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. You do beautiful work. And it's, it's wonderful to see you do that, because you do beautiful work. Thank you. Know, you. The, one of the questions we'd like to put before you, uh, when I was giving a bit of an introduction, claiming you as you know, our mentor. You have mentored hundreds of young activists, some of us uh, getting gray in the hair, not so young anymore. But can you, how do you see your role as a mentor and in light of the transition that you and Artis and Carol are now going to make at Jonah House. So how, how is your mm -hmm. mentoring going to continue, and how do you see that role? Well, um, we have sent out a letter to many people. I don't know how many of the folks participating tonight uh, have received that. But um, we are making changes. We have two young couples who are moving into the house. Um, the first ones will arrive within the next week or two, and then the other couple by mid-August. 
And by the end of August, we'll start moving toward two distinct but related communities. Um, and I've been motivated in this. When our daughter Frida was born, her uncle Dan wrote a series of poems for Frida, which when she was maybe eight or nine, I lettered into a book. Phil and I pasted pictures of her into that book. And then we wrote a little introduction saying, these are poems that your uncle wrote for you when you were born. You may understand some of them now, but you will come to understand them in time. And um, we hope that you will begin to use this book for your own thoughts. And she's been doing journaling ever since that time. That was her first journal. But one of those poems has stood out for me, and it goes something like this. I am about puff, puff to admit you to a secret wisdom. To it, there are no secrets. And what little wisdom you will come on will lie at the end of your own room. These words wish you well and promise, unlike the debris that clings, a stench, a something stinking, shining like dead cat's eyes, to keep the hell out of your way. And I think one of the things Art of Carol and I are aware of is the need to keep to hell out of their way. There's much that we know we need to share and impart. We need to let them know what we've done and why we've done it and how we've done it, and then say, but it's yours now. You have to decide what you're going to continue doing, what you're not going to continue doing, and how. And um, that's what we're kind of focused on at this point. And by the end of this year, certainly, we will be living in the old caretaker's house. And they will, as community, and they will be in the house that we built with the help of so many others, um, distinct and yet somewhat related. I think that we recognize that as part of the aging process, our lifestyles are very different from the lifestyles of younger people. And they should be. And they ought to be able to decide how they want to do what they want to do. So that's, um, we're really trying to give serious thought to this transition. And I think we're doing that. Um, so far, so good. But it's a lot of, uh, we want to do it and get out of the way. You know, to be there when that's desired, but not to be in anybody's face. And not to expect that they are going to live as we live. If you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Liz, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions we want to get to, but before we do, um, I want to say to our audience that there's so much more, um, so many more stories, so much more to learn about this amazing legacy. Uh, we want to direct you all to the Jonah House webpage where there are archived hundreds of photos of actions and community pictures. Mm -hmm. I want to say to all 30 of you online here that this has been a free community webinar, and we appreciate the great response. But we want to take a moment, and this is uh, against Liz's wishes, I'm sure. But we want to make a pitch to each of you who have been participating to help Liz and Ardith and Carol and the new folks coming in this transition. Last month, as Liz mentioned, Jonas sent out only its second fundraising appeal in 40 years, which is amazing. Uh, and now, tonight, each of us has an opportunity to pay something forward for the privilege of spending this last hour and a half with Liz. So we want to invite each of you who have participated tonight, and those of you who are seeing this on the archive, to put, in a, put a check in the mail to um, one of, made out to one of these two um, aspects of the new Jonah House, the St. Peter's Restoration Cemetery, 
foundation, which will go to help the work of the new community uh, and the, the grounds, and for a check to Jonah House for the continuing work of Liz and Ardeth and Carol. So please, um, before uh, too much time goes by, sit down, write a check. Um, you can go to the Jonah House website and see where to send it. Um, so, Liz, a um, couple of questions on the board. Um, one uh, of the participants asked, um, and I'm going to ask them both to you and then you can respond, whether there, <clears throat> there is a style of contemplation in prison. Uh, is there a place for prayer and contemplation or is it just sheer survival? Uh, and the, the other question uh, from our friend Jared in Australia um, is, have there been, is there an artistic aspect to symbolic direct action or uh, aside from just sheer faithfulness? Is there a, a part of liturgy and art um, uh, happening there? If you'd uh, maybe respond to that. Well, I, I, everybody that I know that has done any time in prison looks for that space of quiet where they can do regular prayer. And I don't know that you can survive it without that. Some people are better at being able to shut out noise. But if it means, you know, waking up at midnight, you wake up at midnight. I usually found in a jail situation that the best time would be early morning when people are tend to sleep in. But, and if yeah, I could get that early morning time in in jail, then the rest of the day was apt to go a whole lot better. But um, different people do different things to make that happen. And um, it's hard to be rigid about it. I found it good to have a list of things I would try to do each day and then mark at the end of the day, what I was able to do, what I wasn't able to do, and then fill in on the things that I wasn't able to do for several days, to put more emphasis on that. Reading the same, I mean, you read the stuff that you want to really focus on and that requires a lot of mental energy in those times when it's most quiet, and then the lighter stuff you can read with a lot of noise going on around you. But some of that noise you also need to enter into. The thing that's hardest in the jail is the noise, isn't it? That, that most people remark on that. Um, a style of contemplation, I think we all do different. In our household, we tend to focus on you know, the scripture and the reflection on scripture and prayer on scripture. And we use the... Uh, Lexio Divina format, for the most part, reading the readings of the day. Um, and spend half an hour together in that each morning here. And then liturgy on a regular basis. Hmm? Is there an artistic aspect of... Um, Yes, but of symbolic action, I think yes, absolutely. I mean, people put a lot into the symbolics, and they put a lot into the banners and the props and what have you. And um, and it's a mixture of art. It's a drama. It's theater. It's um, uh, music. Some people are really good at that. Some of us are terrible, but. We do try to involve all those elements into our witnesses. And we try to be creative with them, too. We aren't always successful, but we do. Liz, um, we're very aware it's very late for you. And we promised we'd end uh, on time. We're just a few minutes over. <laughs> um, but we, we want to thank you for being with us in this way. Uh, you are such a gift to us uh, as a friend, as a mentor, as a fellow activist. And we hope you feel the love 
of all of these folks who are chatting their appreciation uh, to you. I want to take a minute and just remind everybody that our next our next webinar is going to be uh, a month from now, Tuesday, July 16th, and it'll be another interview, uh, this time with the two biblical scholars, Norman Gottwald and Jack Elliott, uh, mm -hmm. who are pioneering scholars in the Old and New Testaments, respectively. should be a very interesting conversation. They're going to talk, among other things, about the project of the Center and Library for the Bible and Social Justice that we've established in Stony Point, New York, as a resource for clergy activists and movement theologians. And half of the proceeds of that webinar will go to support the Center and Library's work. So be sure and help us spread the word. We don't have any advertising apparatus, so we rely on you all to uh, spread the word. Um, I want to pass it to Elaine to uh, thank, thank Liz and close us uh, okay, well. out. Can I thank you for all you put into making this happen? You are awesome. I love you. <laughs> we love you and thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you uh, for mentoring us and providing light uh, and guidance. We love you so much and can't wait to put our arms around you soon. Thank you. Too. Good night. Mm -hmm. and thanks right. to Tim and Tim. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary. Yes, thanks to Tim and Tim.